Um, the, the talk of today is about the exclusive producer, uh, which is a relatively new feature. So this is, was released in POSA 2.8, so it's, it's really fresh out of the, out of the box. And, and the context here is how can we use POSA to build distributed applications? Uh, so POSA is a distributed system on its own, but uh, increasingly like more applications are as well distributed and they need some kind of a coordination. And they're like already uh, existing solutions for that. And I will go through them. And uh, first, let, let me introduce myself. So I am Matteo Mali. I'm the CTO at Extreme Native. Uh, I am one of the co creator of uh, Apache Pulsar, and I also serve as the PMC chair for Apache Pulsar. I am also a PMC member of Apache, Apache Bookkeeper. And in the past, I've been at Splunk. I was one of the co-founders of Streamio, and I spent a long time at, at, at Yahoo when we started the, the Postal project. As I say, the agenda here. So let's first like go through some of the uh, common patterns that uh, we, we can see like the very, very high level like, uh, when you're building distributed applications. And I will explain why it is a tricky business. Uh, there are like a, a lot of uh, intricacies in how to build these applications. We'll talk about the fencing and how Postal uh, can help to, to solve these problems. And finally, I will just give a glance on how we implemented this feature. So to start with uh, common patterns for this particular application, the, one of the most common one is the distributed locks. Uh, Everyone is familiar with the uh, locks and mutexes on, uh, uh, on, a, uh, on a single node. If, if you're using Java or any other, other, other language, there are like, constructs to, to acquire locks on a particular resource, right? And uh, you take a locks to have exclusive access to this, this uh, shared resource. If you are in a, in, a, in a single process, that resource could be a variable. If you are in a distributed con uh, uh, context, this resource could be, um, uh, writing to a file on a NFS mount, for example, or writing to a cell in a database. And if typically you have a lock service that is uh, mediated between multiple clients and a client will express their interest to acquire a lock on resource one. And the lock service will say, okay, uh, you have the lock. And then if a client too tries to do the same, we try to acquire the lock on the same resource, you will get an error because the, the lock is, is already taken by client one. Now, if client one fails, either there's a network partitions or that the process crashes or the machine crashes, whatever kind of failure, then the job of the, of the lock service here is to make sure that the lock is automatically re released. And that will ensure that Client two, if it tries again, now it will be able to succeed and acquire the lock. Uh, like, say, say some of really a uh, few example of these uh, usefulness of distributed locks are like you can use them to prevent conflicting modification to a shared resource, um, like writing to a database table or database record. You can have as granular as granular as as you need. Also, you can use them for ownership and assignment. Um, say, if I take the lock, I'm the owner on, of this uh, uh, resource or like uh, I, I, will, uh, I will assign it to someone else. And finally, for survey discovery, for example, like if I want to know uh, who owns this resource, I could read the lock value and understand who is the current owner. And that might change in the future. So I, Back forgiveness in uh, just now. The, this talk we have a lot of secret diagram. I understand to communicate a lot of like complex interaction between multiple systems. So uh, please follow follow me on on this. Um, the other uh, king of this uh, uh, system problem is leader elections. Um, leader election is is a, is a very compelling uh, uh, pattern uh, for for ma for many people because. It really uh, helps to reduce a distributed system problem into a local problem. And uh, the theory here is that uh, instead of having um, multiple uh, clients or like servers, uh, multiple components to, to have to agree every single time on every single decision, instead you want to make, basically elect a leader among peers and uh, and then have this leader make all the decisions and then communicate them to others. So everyone ran the same code. So everyone 
can become the leader, but only one becomes the leader, and that that, that leader will make this will, will make will take decisions. That leader will perform some tasks that, that you want to only perform by one single instance of your service. And then there is also typically the component that uh, it is used that the leader should be able to communicate to the others what decision was taken, um, so that the leaders are aware of the of the new state. And uh, one such as example of use cases is traffic load, load, load manager. That's like we have it in, in Porsche as well. Uh, the, the the idea here is that we want to have a single uh, broker to, to, to take the, the, the decision where to assign new groups of topics. We don't want to have the chaos of everyone uh, trying to assign uh, uh, things like left, left and right. Uh, so we, instead, we delegate only to one. Typically, the interaction here is that every client, every, uh, every node comes up and tries to become the leader. Um, so you try to become a leader and only one succeeds. So the leader election service will only uh, say okay to one, one of them. Once this uh, node uh, thinks that, that he, he's the leader, then it will, it will do all these tasks. And if this client fails, um, the leader election service will automatically release the leadership. So now it is released and it will select another available client and it will uh, tell him that you, you know the leader and this new client will with the cover and start doing the, the, the same set, set of, of tasks. Um, so the, 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 the theory of both the, 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 these little locks and the leader action is easy, is very compelling and it really sim simplifies how you have to reason about these components. Um, and there are several options to do like this, uh, this kind of operation. So these are like, like coordination services, and there are different semantics, but they have very very similar cap capabilities. And uh, the the most known and used ones are Zookeeper and ETCD. Um, again, the the APIs are different; they have different mechanisms, but that's that's really the you can do the same things on both on both systems. There are performance differences and different design choices, but at the end of the day, you can do the same stuff. So, how do you do that? This with the locks with the Zookeeper, for example. So, if you are or if you if you are a Zookeeper user, uh, you have a Zookeeper client. You try to create an ephemeral Z node. If that Z node exists, means that the lock is already taken, so you fail to acquire the lock. If you if you are successful and you create that that Z node, you know you're the, the owner. So it is an ephemeral Z node because that Z node it is tied to this to the session that the client has with Zookeeper. So if the Zookeeper session is um, is expires, then every ephemeral node, including this lock, goes away, and uh, that gives the chance to someone else to go on and and reacquire it. Uh, ETCD has a similar mechanism, but instead of having a single session that the client maintains with with the, with the service, it has each key can have a different TTL. The, the point here is that you have to refresh the, the, the key. Uh, so if you have a TTL of say 30 seconds, then before 30 seconds pass, you have to refresh that key to, to make sure that it does not expire in the service. If you look at little action, Zookeeper is, it is doing that in a slightly different way. Uh, you have, uh, Zookeeper has a notion of sequential ephemeral Z nodes. The, the sequential part of it means that Zookeeper will automatically prepend a version number to the Znode name. So if I try to create a foo and I mark it as sequential, Zookeeper will create say five dash foo. And uh, if someone else tried to create foo again, it will uh, as a se sequential, it will create six dash foo. Um, at that point, you might have like a, a directory with a, 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 a like these uh, version Z nodes under it. And each one knows, um, can get a list of them. And typically you choose that the lowest version number is the leader. And uh, this is like a more like a, a stable uh, algorithm because when, when the leader goes away, it is there is no fighting to become the leader. It is more like there's already but the, the next lowest now becomes the leader. So, and everyone else gets not, notified when the leader is gone so that they, they, they will check again and they will realize that uh, there's a new leader. Now it's not, it's not like five, now, now, now it's six. It is six. For ETCD, this is similar to using locks. Um, it is, a, again, keys with, with TTLs, and you have to basically recreate that. And if you create that, that lock, now, now you, you're the leader. 
So I'll say this is a tricky business. So it seems very easy, but it is not as easy as it seems. And there are a few reasons why it is not uh, easy. Um, this system, like ETCD and Zookeeper, works very well. They're like very mature systems. They work as, as advertised. The problem is that they're like fine prints, which people often overlook. And um, these fine prints are not within the what the Zookeeper gives you. is more like how you're using that uh, building block to, to have your leader election. Um, there are like a couple of difficult questions, typically, that are how can you be sure that there are not two clients that at the same time they're thinking that I'm the leader and I'm the leader? Um, there's, 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 a, there's a timing problem there. And also, like, what happens when you have interaction with other systems? Like, if I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I got notified that I am the leader, I'm trying to write it to the DB, but these two operations are not atomic. So I may be the leader, now I'm trying to write it to be, but now I'm not a leader anymore. Uh, so someone else might think that he is a leader at the same time that I think it too. So we, these are not, these kind of issues are not really addressed by these coordination services. So you have to build something on top of it. And it's really not easy to do. Um, let's say we have, the first question was the concurrent owner problem. How can we guarantee that Client one, in this case, does, uh, will, re re will release the resource before it expires on the lock service. So let's uh, see, see this, this, this sequence. Uh, we have client one acquires the lock. It gets the okay from the lock service. And um, after it gets the okay, now there is a natural partition. So natural partition means that we cannot communicate, we don't have connectivity to the lock service for some amount of time. We don't know. Uh, it might be that the process it is not responsive. It might be that net network issue. It might be there can be a, a huge number of possible issues. After, um, say, a session expires on the lock service, the lock service will uh, release automatically the lock. And at this point, um, a client two might come in and acquire the lock again and say, now, now I, I own this. But we have absolutely no way of guaranteeing with 100% accuracy that client one is aware that he has lost this ownership. Um, you might try to re reduce the chances. There are ways that you can give up the resource if you're partitioned from, from the service, but there is no way to get the uh, absolute assurance that uh, this thread that processed that notification that you're not the owner anymore gets executed before that, that, that lock gets required. So if that happens, that's a, bit, that's a big problem because now you have a split, a split brain. Now you have um, two, two clients, both thinking that, that there are the owners at the same time and they can be do conflicting stuff. And typically, yes, after the, fail, the failure gets detected, then the client one will, will get that not notification, it will reduce the lock and the things will go back to normal, but you still have this potential window of time in which you have these two uh, owner of the locks. And the next question was, what, what if you're like interacting with the external system? Um, so in this case, uh, assuming that client one again acquires, acquires the lock on the resource one, yes, okay. And then there is a network partition. At the same time, we're trying to, uh, to write a file on a NFS mount, for example. So this write request gets issued. And then uh, there's a network partition here. And the lock service will freeze the lock because client one cannot talk with the lock service. Um, client two will acquire that, that lock and say that, OK, I'm, I'm the owner. So I can write to, to, to this file because there, there's no one else writing. But we have no way of canceling that write request from client one to, 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 the, to the NFS. Um, so what happens there, in, now, now you have like two writers on the same file and you, you get data corruptions, lost data, and, uh, and a lot of not so funny stuff happening. Um, the problem is, here is that we are not fencing the resources. Uh, so we need coordination between the, the, the coordination system and what the outcome of the, this decision and these tasks that, that are carried over. The, 
In particular, we need to make sure that the ownership of the shared resource, it is also validated in the external system. For example, if client one is writing to, to the database and client two starts to write into the database, we have to make sure that the database will reject any pending writes from client one. Otherwise, we, we always have this possibility of having these conflicting writes. One ex example of fencing is Bookkeeper. So Bookkeeper has fencing uh, ingrained into the core protocol. And uh, the way Bookkeeper uses fencing is that you might have, say, one client that creates a ledger and then starts writing some entries. And these entries get written to Bookie 1 and Bookie 2. So we have entry 10, 0, 10, 10, 1. And they get both, both written on both bookies. Now, if an, uh, another Bookkeeper client tries to open this ledger 10 for reading, it will trigger a ledger recovery. And the first thing that ledger recovery will do is to fence the ledger. That means that it will go to every storage node and say that do not accept any more writes on ledger 10. Ledger 10 is fenced. And that thing, and that uh, bit of information, it is persisted. Um, and then client will initiate the, the, the recovery process. It will uh, read the ledger and try to figure out. And if there were any uh, other um, pending writes from client one that, that, that is still trying to write on this ledger, that will both get errored because any any storage node will say that the ledger is fenced. Your 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 write is it, uh, rejected. So this is an example of, of, of this fencing me mechanism. And fencing is a very really powerful property because it gives you the guarantee of having one single writer on the one resource. Um, the Thing is that okay? Why uh, why why not expose indirectly Bookkeeper if you want to do these kind of locks and fencing? The thing is that Bookkeeper doesn't really do leader actions or distributed locks. Is the fencing is a way of the Bookkeeper protocol to ensure that the data uh, correctness and consistency. And the, furthermore, the the Bookkeeper API is more like low low level, um, and applications are typically more happy to use a high level API like like a Porsche client API. So this is one of the reasons that we, we did the exclusive producer. We want to have the same uh, uh, correctness and same capabilities, but exposed through the Postal Client API. The goals for this feature were basically, we want to make, to make sure that people are able to ensure a linear non interleaved history of the messages. So you have producer one, has its own history and then producer one goes away and now producer two comes in and has its own history of messages. And to do so, we want to uh, expose the building blocks for creating things like a literal action distributed locks directed to the poster users and expose fencing as a new property and constant in poster. Uh, Using, using this feature, it, 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 it is easy, very easy. There is a, just a flag when you get the producer, you won't specify the access mode. The default access mode is shared, which is the, 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 current, the current behavior before 208. Uh, so you can change that into ex exclusive. That means that if you try to get a, a, a producer on this my topic, and uh, if there is already a, an, a, an existing producer, and that producer will, I will get an error immediately. I will fail because I would say that uh, the topic is busy. I cannot create the, the producer now. Uh, there is a, a variant here, uh, which is uh, the wait for exclusive. Uh, it is very similar, but the difference is that you don't get an error immediately. Instead, the create will, uh, the create call will be pending and waiting until. Um, I have the chance to become the student producer. So if it is busy, I will just wait there until the existing producer will go away. I talk about this non-interleaved history of, uh, of data in the topic. Um, so the, the, the most important part of this feature is that once a, once a producer it is fenced, uh, no more data will be accepted from, from him. Um, so that we can have this linear history and with one segment for each producer. So if you look here, now we have producer one, it creates the exclusive producer, you get the okay. So now you are you can send message one and uh, and get an okay. Uh, at the same time, producer two is trying to be exclusive as well, but it's a wait for exclusive. And now since it is busy already, it will wait. Um, if there's a natural partition and um, at this point, uh, the the topic will will basically uh, 
de declare that producer one is gone, I will have to pick up a new a new excluded producer. So it will choose producer two and say producer K to producer two. Uh, at this point, the, the the topic will not accept any more writes from producer one. So uh, the second block is the history of producer two. So if, if if there was a pending message in flight from producer one, it would be, it would be rejected with a spe special error saying that producer is fenced and, we, and now we, are, we only accept messages from producer two. So for the implementation of this feature, we have added a new concept, which is a topic epoch. So the, the epoch is just a counter, and but it is stored in top topic metadata. And we, we only use it if you're using the exclusive, exclusive producer feature. And the epoch is incremented each time there's a new exclusive producer that becomes active. And uh, if a producer is trying to, um, to use a, an epoch that, that is lower than the current epoch, it will get a producer fence exception. And once a producer it is fenced, this, this, this producer instance is um, cannot be used again. So it is fenced forever. So you have to close it and throw it away and try to create a new, a new producer instance because we, we will not accept any more rights from the, this, this producer. So how does the epoch work? Um, so the, we say that the epoch only change, changes if, we, if there is a new producer taking over. So the first time that a producer does, doesn't know its own epoch. So I will create a producer and specify that epoch, my, my epoch is equal known. So the first time it gets incremented, so now we have a topic with epoch one get, gets assigned. Um, and in the, in the producer OK, the, the broker will specify your epoch is one. So now this producer, it gets marked himself as epoch one producer. I can send the messages and get the message OK. If there's an error, uh, I, I, this producer will try to reconnect. So if there is no other issue here, the producer will be able to reconnect because the epoch is the same as the epoch of the topic. And there is no different, uh, there, there is no like a segmentation here. So it is still the same epoch and we can continue and write new messages as nothing happened. But if you're taking a different example, um, in, in the same thing, so we start with none. Now topic has epoch one. There is an error, and um, when when the topic uh, takes producer one out as the exclusive producer during during this network error, producer two might come in. So if producer if if producer two comes in, it says my epoch is none, and the the, the topic will assign it a epoch number two now. So now we are we change the epoch. Producer two is in epoch two, producer one is in epoch one. So when the producer one tries to reconnect again with epoch one, then we say producer is fast. We don't accept any, uh, and then we, you have to close it. So just to put everything together, uh, we talk about the exclusivity and the fencing. Uh, so just try to put these two properties together. Um, and this, this is more like, what can we do with this with this feature? Um, we say that one of the goal was to allow people to implement literal action using Pulsar and nothing nothing else than Pulsar. And um, the way you, you you do this is that you have uh, multiple servers here and they, and they are all peers between each other. And you want um, each each of them will try to become the exclusive producer. So if you are if you become the exclusive producer, now you are the leader among these peers. So if, since you're the leader, you, you can make these decisions and uh, carry on some tasks. And uh, this task and decision will be communicated exclusively by publishing on the topic. Because if a message is written, the decision is taken. So if you are not, if by the, the time you make the decision and you write on the topic, you are, you're not the leader anymore, that, that right will not go through. Uh, so this is the fencing uh, that gets, gets applied. Uh, if you look at the CKS diagram here is that uh, server one, server two and server three comes up and each of them tries to be uh, wait for exclusive. Um, the topic will, will be choosing server, server one. And one item here that um, you might want to do is that when you come up, you want to read all the messages that are there that were pending. So you might be down. So you, you come up and you have to basically read to, to the end of the topic. And what, one of the way that, that you can read to the end of the topic is to by sending a marker and then read everything up to, this, up to uh, until you, you see the, the marker. 
So now you are the SQL producer, you have the complete view of the current state, and, um, and now you are ready to be, to be the leader. So server one is the leader, and server one can uh, take an action. And this action takes the form of publishing a message. So is publishing message three on the topic. If that succeeds, means that this action is taken. Uh, so server one will do the thing, and everyone else also will, will, will get uh, the message, and they will be aware of the current state. So this is really a, a clean way to do the literal action, and uh, it's basically uh, uh, free of any race conditions because like if you are the leader and you think you, you're, the, you're the leader and you're trying to say send message four at this point uh, but you lost the leadership because you're disconnected with the topic for a, for a brief amount of time that publishing message four will fail so therefore we get revalidated there So sim very similarly, if you want to do like distributed logs using Pulsar, it, it, again, you, you create an exclusive producer and you, if, you, if, it, if you're successful, you are the owner of the lock and you have to just have to make, make sure that all the mutation to the resource should be done through the messages publishing on the, on the topic. Therefore, you, you get the advantages of, of, the, of the fencing come, coming naturally. So I hope this was useful and uh, that opened uh, uh, the interest on this new feature uh, that is really uh, unique to Pulsar at this point. And uh, I made this uh, call yesterday, but I will do it again today. So uh, at, at Stream Native, we are hiring. So you can join us to build, uh, to build Pulsar with the same team that builds Pulsar. And uh, we have like a lot of interesting problems like this one or subscriptions subscription, so or working on transactions. So we have no, no uh, lack of interesting uh, ideas to work on uh, to make Pursar uh, better. Uh, I will also add that uh, we next week, we also have the, the developer trainings. So if you're interested into how you can use Pursar to build uh, applications that call the best practices,